like to welcome you to our services here at First Baptist Church. We come this day on the second Advent season, the second Sunday of Advent, and welcome you in the name of Christ. And for those of you that are visiting from home as well, we invite you to join with us as we worship this day. We come as brothers and sisters in Christ setting aside all things with the anticipation of the birth as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come this hour and let us pray.
Please join me in the call to worship found in your worship guide. John the Baptist said, prepare the way. So family of faith, how do we prepare our minds for worship? We silence the inner critic. We let go of busy thoughts. We make a space for God to speak. How do we prepare our hearts for worship? We bless all emotions. We feel what we feel. We open ourselves up to be moved. How do we prepare our bodies for worship? We take in the scent, sight, and feel of this space. We breathe in God's mercy. We exhale God's love. How do we prepare our souls for worship? We bring our whole selves into this space. We wear our hearts on our sleeves. We trust that even now, God is here. Family of faith, what we practice in worship, we must live out in our daily lives. So prepare the way. Let us worship, holy God. Let us pray. While we wait for your coming into our hearts and into our lives, we prepare for your coming by worshiping you, O Holy One, this day. May we focus on the hope we have in you that you will send the Prince of Peace to reign. And while we wait this day, we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now stand as we lift up our voices and songs of praise, hymn 173. 173. Thank you. 
that there is another way. Amen. Let us sing him 82, Life to Life, the Fire of Life. Good job. So, believe it or not, Ebenezer Scrooge wasn't always a bad person. Um, what I remember from the movie that I watched was that he and like one of the um, girls that he liked um, was he actually they broke up, or it was not his sister. Let me introduce the new children's pastor, Avery. <laughs> Avery is correct. Avery is absolutely correct. So, by the way, if you haven't had a chance to read it or have your parents read it to you, please have them read you that book, that, that story over Christmas and watch the movie. It's really good. Cool. Reading the book is better. But anyway, that being said, so his girlfriend was, um, he loved his girlfriend very much. She loved him very much. But he loved, but, he, but sadly, he lost his way. What do you remember him loving more than his girlfriend? 
Money. Money. There's a verse in the Bible that says money, the love of money is the root of all evil. And because he loved the money more than he loved his girlfriend, who loved him very much, she eventually said, hey, I, I, don't, I don't need this. He then became a very bitter person, all he cared about was making more money. And he was, um, and he had his partner, his partner named um, um, Marla. And, um, that is right. Thank you. Marla. And um, so he fell asleep, and he had this, um, a person that worked for him named Bob Cratchit. And he had a little, a little boy named, named Tiny Tim who was really sick. He had Cratchit's, and he didn't die. Um, uh, he, he, he didn't die. Stay, stay with him. But he put in the story. Yeah, yes. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, so it, he fell asleep. Um, and so because uh, Bob Cratchit uh, said he wanted Christmas Day off, and then he just kind of got mad about it, but said, all right, yeah, I guess I'll give you the day off. Well, that night he went to bed, and um, he was visited by three ghosts, ghosts of Christmas past, ghosts of Christmas present, ghosts of Christmas future. And through all that, the thing that finally made him find his way was when he found out that Tiny Tim might die if he didn't get the care that he needed. So a little boy, a little boy helped a grumpy old man become a good man again. We know of another little boy that helped a bunch of grumpy old people become good too, him home. Jesus? Yeah, Jesus, look at what he did for Zacchaeus, the tax collector and all that. So I mean, even though Ebenezer Scrooge lost his way, he found his way because of a little boy, because of all the dreams, he wanted to do really good things afterwards. And so it's never too late when we make mistakes to, to come back. And the story that Pastor Chris is going to talk about this morning is about when John the Baptist was telling people who lost their way, hey, you got to you got to get your acts together and come back to Jesus. So what I would encourage you to do, what I would encourage you to do this week to try and make this story make a little sense to you, is if you happen to see somebody lost in the hallway at your school, you probably see them all the time. Help them find a way. Help them find a way. And then just be kind to them because you don't know what kind of day they're having or what's going on. And you may be the one person that truly helps them find a way in other ways too. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God help, us help us to find our way, find our way by following you, by following you. And, help and help us to help others find their way Before him. 
Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. Speak to God.
begin our Advent series titled Those Who Dream, and today we prepare the way. So I'm going to be reading from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. In the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Will you please pray with me? God of peace, we must admit there are a million things on our minds this day. We would like to be focused, be as focused as John the Baptist, preparing the way, gathering the crowd, and spreading the word of your arrival. Maybe then we would know peace. However, more often than not, we are a swirling compilation of grocery lists, text messages, emails, an over-referenced to-do list. So today we ask for your help in preparing the way. Could you please start with our ears and then maybe move to our hearts? We'd like to hear you more clearly. Maybe then we'll know peace. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. The name of our sermon today is Waiting on the Dream. Have you ever come across someone who made you feel really uncomfortable or maybe even unsafe? Well, if any of us were approached by someone resembling John the Baptist, we would probably call the police. So if you look at the front of your worship guide, or there's the images up here on the screen, this is my favorite image of John the Baptist. I've shown it before. Um, it is found in a little tiny Episcopalian church in West Jefferson, North Carolina. The fresco is found in St. Mary's Church. Now, this tiny little Episcopal church was on the verge of closing in the mid-1970s. So they hired a new rector named Fulton Hodge, and he collaborated with the famous fresco artist Benjamin R. Long IV, to create three frescoes in their small sanctuary. Now, in the middle of these three frescoes is Jesus Christ. He is on the cross, and his spirit is ascending. And then on the left is a very pregnant Mary, and she looks a little distressed, I have to say. And then on the right is this fresco of John the Baptist. And if you look at it, you can see that he's dressed in camel's clothes. His hair and his beard, they look like they probably haven't been washed or cut in quite a while. And he is skinny as a cactus. And if you look really closely, you can see he has this wild look in his eyes. And then he's carrying that stick. John's out there living in the wilderness and eating bugs and honey. Yes, if this dude showed up here in worship, I think we'd probably call the police. John the Baptist was a wild man. Now, each of the four Gospels in our Bible begin in different ways. 
you look at Matthew, it begins with the genealogy of Jesus. And then Luke begins with an orderly account of events that have been fulfilled among us. And then the Gospel of John begins with in the beginning. Now they each begin in different ways for different theological reasons and purposes. Now Mark begins with an incomplete sentence, which should make all English teachers go, no, no, no. <laughs> Mark begins with the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark's gospel does not have angels whispering in Mary's ear the good news of Jesus coming birth. Nor are there any shepherds watching their flocks at night. There are no wise men who are traveling from the east following a star. And there are no big eyed animals standing around a straw stuffed manger. Mark either doesn't care about these things or maybe he doesn't know about them. For him, the good news of Jesus Christ begins in the wilderness of Judea with an old-timer prophet named John. John was the first real prophet to show up for the people of Israel in over 300 years. So this wild man, John, shows up dressed in the same clothes as the prophet Elijah had worn 800 years earlier. Camel's hair and a leather belt. Now, you know, they say fashion always comes back around. I guess it took 800 years for this fashion to come back into style. So surely John is out in the wilderness trying to make some kind of statement. Now, for us today, we might have a hard time trying to figure out what he is doing and what he's talking about. But those who were around him in that day, they understood what he was doing. John was a messenger predicted by Isaiah in the passage that Michael read earlier. He was dressed like Elijah, and he was sent by God. John was a prophet in the classic mold. Maybe that's why people flocked to him in those days. It's really hard to know. Everything we know about John, his bizarre clothes, his weird diet, his unkempt hair, and probably a stink to go along with it, all of those things would probably have kept us from going out to see him. Remember we were to call the police? Truthfully, he sounds a lot like a street preacher that we might see today. Someone that's waving their Bible and telling you you're going to go to hell if you don't repent right now. Only there's one big difference between John and a street preacher. Street preachers are self-appointed prophets and they tend to plant themselves right in your way so that you have to cross to the other side of the road to avoid them. But John, he planted himself out in the middle of nowhere. He set up shop in the wilderness. And anyone who wanted to hear what he had to say, they had to go to a lot of trouble to go hear him. They had to borrow their neighbor's donkey, or they had to set out on foot with enough water and food for that long journey which led down lonely trails that were thick with robbers and bandits. So why on earth would anyone go to all the trouble to travel out to the wilderness to see this wild man, John, especially someone who lived in Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem, if you remember, was where the temple was, and it's where the rabbis were, and it's where all the accumulated wisdom of the religious establishment was. If someone wanted to hear from God, then why not stay in the city and maybe go to some extra services at the temple or maybe make an appointment with one of the rabbis to talk with the rabbi or a chief priest? Anyone who would turn away all that and set off into the wilderness 
was looking for something else, something that the temple could not or would not supply. And John had it. He was as scary as someone from another planet, but when he spoke, it was as if he were repeating what God was saying to him right at that moment, sentence by sentence. He did not have all the details. He did not know the name of the one who was coming or what he would look like. But the old world was about to come to an end. And the new world was coming at him fast, carried in the arms of God's chosen one. You see, my friends, John had a dream. He caught a glimpse of a dream that belonged to God, a dream that was passed on to John, a dream that the people of Israel had been waiting and waiting and waiting on for hundreds of years, a dream delayed. They were waiting on the dream for what seemed like forever. It was a dream full of good news. The dream involved a world that would be built out of new materials, not the rearranged stones of the old religion. The Holy Spirit and God's dream had gotten all but covered up in the holy city of Jerusalem. Pretend piety, temple taxes, and priestly hocus pocus had covered up. God's dream. The flame was all but snuffed out under the weight of all the religion that had gotten in the way of God's dream. So God moved out into the wilderness where the air was crisp and clean out under the canopy of stars. God's dream showed up in the most socially unacceptable character anyone could imagine. Dressed in animal hair with a piece of tan hide around his waist, his breath heavy with locust and wild honey, John proclaimed the dream, the delayed dream, that someone was coming. Someone so spectacular that it was not simply enough to just hang around waiting for him to arrive. It was time to get ready. It was time to prepare the way so that when the promised one came, when the dream arrived, he could walk right to their doors and into their hearts. That was the good news. That was God's dream. And it started here with John. You see, John was God's messenger, and the message lit him up like a bonfire in the wilderness. And people were drawn to him. Apparently not only because of who he was and what he said, but also because of what he offered them. A chance to start over and be clean, to stop pretending that they were someone else. And by allowing them to wash off their sin. The bath was John's idea. There were not any rules about how it was supposed to happen, and the rabbis, they sure hadn't okayed it. It was something that John offered to those who came to him. Even women who were not allowed in the inner precincts of the temple, even well-known sinners who would not have dreamed of trying to get inside the temple, everyone was welcome. Everyone was invited. John's baptism bypassed the temple and all its rites. Setting up shop in the wilderness, he proclaimed his freedom from so-called civilization with all of its rules and requirements. He called people to turn around so that they would not miss the new things that God was doing right before their eyes. He wanted them to catch a glimpse of God's dream. What is so interesting to me about that wild man, John, the messenger of God's dream, was that he was nowhere near the temple or a church. And those who were inside the church insisted on staying inside the church 
then they never heard the message. Only those who were willing to go out into the desert got a taste of God's freedom. And many of them were still there when the dream finally arrived in the person of Jesus. God's dream of sending a Savior into the world took a long time. The people of Israel waited for hundreds of years before the dream appeared. And the same is true of all of us Christians who have followed. Because we still wait for the coming of the dream to reappear. We are waiting on Jesus' second coming. We are waiting for love to come again. We are waiting on the dream. And so what does one do when one is waiting on the dream to come again? We prepare. We prepare the way. As Isaiah says, prepare the way of the Lord. So here's a poem by Sarah R. titled Prepare. My dad built me a changing table. For nine months, my mom watched her ankles swell and her belly grow. For nine months, my dad would come home from work, kiss her on the forehead, and tell her that she was beautiful. Then for nine months, he would slip into the garage to build sand dust sand castles and a dresser out of dreams. I imagine she smiled, perched in that rocking chair. He was in the wood shop, preparing the way. Eighteen years later, I left for college. As I packed my bags, my mom baked some blueberry muffins for the road, the smell of home. She wrapped them in foil and placed them in a cardboard box, willing similar layers of protection to be wrapped around me, her little girl. She was preparing the way. My aunts and uncles bought sweatshirts in my new school colors. My dad taught me how to change a tire. And my mom gave me the earrings that I've been sneaking from her jewelry box for the last four years. And I hid sticky notes, love letters, on the kitchen door for them to find when they returned home. We were quiet in the car. My brother cried. We were all preparing the way. And through these moments, I have come to see that preparation and love can be the same thing. But there is something about love that makes us want to prepare. There is something about love that compels us to throw open the doors, yell it from the rooftop, set the table, decorate the nursery, leave love notes on the back door, build the changing table, trim the tree, bake muffins for the road, and when it's time, if you must, let go. Preparation and love can be the same thing. My friends, we, like the Israelite people, are waiting on the dream. We are waiting for Jesus. So let us all prepare the way. Amen. Will you please join me in our affirmation of faith found in your worship? We will read this in unison together. We believe that a voice cried out in the wilderness, saying, Prepare the way of the Lord. And so we show up in church pews on cold, blustery days. We march for justice. We roll up our sleeves. We plant trees for our children. We make ours. We choose hope. We gather at the table. We set an extra place. We sing loudly with joy. 
We share stories and wisdom. We celebrate children. We fall together. We rise together. We love together. We do all these things because we believe that God loves us so much that God shows up here. So we prepare and prepare for that next beautiful day. May it be so. Amen. Our hymn of response today is hymn number 143, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And I'll be down front if anyone would like to make a decision. Let's stand and sing together hymn number 143.
25 days for us each day that we can then go on and go forth and go out to serve, to serve man, to bring love, to bring kindness. Because we are the fighters. We are here then to show that love to bring out to the world, then to offset all the bad things going on in the world. We respect. We accept. We tolerate. As we work together with mankind, we can make the world a better place. Dear Lord, these gifts that have been given today, that may they be provided then to the church, and they may reach out, support our meals program, support the thermal shelter, support love. God is great. All the time. Please be seated for just a moment. I'd like to welcome these folks who are worshiping from home today. Mike and Sandy Benefrock, Mike and Diane Goodwin, Allison Winker, and Susan McIntyre. We're so glad you all joined us this day. So the white gifts are ready to be picked up to be delivered, and they are in the fellowship hall. Um, so if you sign up to take a gift, please go to the fellowship hall. Lisa will meet you there to take this. And are there extra gifts that still need to be claimed or they're all that all be spoken for? Wonderful. Thank you all so much for taking a, a little gift to the folks who are homebound or shedding. We're so grateful for your willingness to do that. Don't children don't forget about roller skating next Sunday afternoon um, on Friday night. Yeah, roller skating. Yeah. Um, on Friday night, we will be having an event for children here um, at six, from 6 to 8 in the Fellowship Hall for E. Wilson children and anyone else, our kids who would like to come. So we also still need workers, so if you can help with that, let Michael know. There, I don't know if you received a blue piece of paper for the poinsettias. Um, those are due, Heather told me, by Friday. So if you um, want to purchase a poinsettia in memory or honor of someone, Please turn that into the church office by Friday so we can get them ordered, and they'll be here on Christmas Eve. Speaking of Christmas Eve, we are doing something different this year. Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, so we are going to, at 10 o'clock, have coffee and donuts here um, as we begin worship together. And then from 10.30 to noon, we will have Christmas Eve worship together, and that will include a Christmas pageant by our children and by the children of our Spanish-speaking congregation. So we're very excited about that, and the children practice this morning, and we'll practice again next week. So make sure you're here on the 24th, and then after the pageant, we will continue in worship by lighting our Advent wreath and having communion, and then we will light our candles, um, individual candles, um, as we go out to celebrate the joy of Jesus' birth. So make sure you're here on the 24th. Um, bring your friends, bring your family. It should be a wonderful day together as we celebrate Jesus' birth. Will you please stand now for a benediction? While man John has told us that Jesus is coming, the dream is coming again, we must prepare the way. So go on your own way this day, and in the days that follow this week, preparing the way for the coming of the Savior. Prepare your hearts, prepare your souls, prepare your minds with love, because Jesus is coming. Amen. Amen.